so this morning, I'm starting the new series on worship, transformation, and reformation. Worship, transformation, and reformation. And you know what transformation means, right? Transformation means to change in form, appearance, nature, or character. To change in form, appearance, nature, or character. So if we're talking about worship, which we define as bringing God pleasure. Worship, which we define as a willful adoration that exalts and enthrones God and dethrones the world, Satan, and our flesh. Worship. What is it about our worship that must change? in its form, in its appearance, in its nature, in its character. Reformation is the act or the process of improving something or someone by removing or correcting faults and problems, etc. right? So in other words, reformation is change for the better. Worship, transformation, and reformation. And my aim is that God will show us what must change in our personal and corporate prayer and worship lives. If there's anybody who thinks he worships, he worships God 100% the best, well, then the next couple of months you can afford not to come to church because you don't need the sermons. But if you're here and you think you're worshiping God at 90%, but you can move to 95%, or you are 5% and you can move to 50% or whatever it is, then this sermon series is for you. The aim is that God himself will show us, yo, This thing about your worship isn't right. It has to change. Leanne, this thing about your worship, about your prayer can be better. That God will show us what must change in our personal and corporate prayer and worship lives that will make us men and women and people after God's own heart. Who did God say that about? This is a man after my own heart. David. So let's go to the scripture. Let's read the context uh, I think it's, in the, it's printed in your bulletin. Let's read from John 4, the scripture from which we got verse 23 and 24. John chapter 4. Let's read from 20 to 24. Let's read a bit of the context, all right? And then I'm going to share this message, worship, transformation, and reformation in three parts. I'll talk about restoration of spirit, reformation by truth, and rebuilding of tent. All right, so let's read together John 4. Later, we'll come and read the Acts passage. John chapter 4, verse 20 to 24. Can we read it aloud together? Let's go. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Number one, restoration of spirit no, go back. I, I don't have the... Okay, all right, I'll come, I'll come to that. Restoration of spirit, reformation by truth, rebuilding of tent. Father, speak to us, including the preacher, because everyone worships, but not everyone worships in spirit and truth. In the next two months... Two to three months as we look at reformations of worship. May you show us by your spirit what needs to change about our individual lives or about our corporate prayer and worship lives. And when you have shown us, may we not resist you. May we humbly confess and say, Lord, change me so that we'll be true worshipers. We'll worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm talking about restoration of spirit. In other words, coming back to worshiping God in spirit. I'll talk about reformation by truth so that we can worship in spirit and in truth. And I'll talk about rebuilding of tent. We're talking about David's tent or David's David's tabernacle. All right. Now, first, let me talk about restoration of spirit. Very soon, I'm going to show you a picture. And uh, Ming showed it earlier, but wait, I'll I'll tell them why that picture. But as we talk about restoration of spirit... 
Listen, everyone worships. Everyone. Everyone worships. Even if they don't worship God, they worship something or someone. Everyone worships. It's just a matter of what or who are you going to worship, but everyone worships. There are people that worship the president or the premier or the prime minister of their country. There are people that worship Mercedes Benz. Worship is basically what is at the center of your life, what you adore. That is worship. And I'm telling you that everyone worships. How do I know everyone worships? Because God wired us in, wired it in, wired it, wired us for that. And so if you don't worship God, you look for something else to worship. Some people worship themselves. Me, myself, and I. That, I call it the unholy trinity. But everyone worships, guys. Everyone worships. It's just a matter of who you worship or what you worship. Even people who say they are atheists worship. They worship secular humanist ideologies. They worship Western liberalization and liberalism. Everyone worships. Even those who say, I don't believe in God, but they are tree huggers and they go and look for trees and oh, thou tree, oh, you know, and some people worship Gaia, the mother earth. I'm telling you, everyone worships. And I told you once about the ESPN adverts that I saw, you know, ESPN, the sports television, and they were showing all these fans and all these hooligans and hey, go and all of that. And they said, for these people, sports is their religion and ESPN is their temple. I am telling you, everyone worships. Now, why am I making this point? Because Jesus said, everyone worships, but they are true worshipers and they are false worshipers. Now, everyone worships and I saw it in an incredible way a few years ago. You know, my, both my wife and I trained when we came to Canada as as financial advisors, both of us have licenses to do investments, insurance, things like that. We both started in the same company before I went to Investors Group. We both started in the same company that used to have a, a yearly convention in Las Vegas um, in, in the MGM Grand. 15,000 people from all across North America meeting every year for business convention. Now, my wife has relatives in, in Vegas. So whenever we went to Vegas, we stay with our relatives. And my wife has an uncle Oh, Uncle T, he's amazing. He knows every corner in Vegas. And he'll take us to the various hotels and show us the various things there. Because each of these hotels, I don't know, how many of you have been to Vegas? I'm not going to ask you what happened in Vegas. Because what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? No. But, <laughs> but, but, but all these hotels have different themes. For example, the MGM Grand is themed after like the African jungle kind of thing. So there are lions. There are actually lions in the hotel that you can see. All right? Um, what other hotels? Vi uh, give me another example. Venetian. That's right. It's, 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 it's designed after Venice. You know Venice, the city in Europe, Venice. And so you actually have all these moats and you can sing in, sit, sit in gondolas and, 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 and paddle in the hotel. I mean, like you are in Venice. Amazing. Every, some of them are patterned after the treasure island. So they are pirates. And then my favorite is the one at Bellagio. There's, there are lights that dance. It's a fountain of lights, and it dances to music. So the, you know, the lights goes, it's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. All right, now all these hotels are in a major street in Las Vegas that is called the Strip. Now, whenever we go to Las Vegas, especially on Sundays, one of the places I love to go, most, to, go to most is the International Church of Las Vegas. It's pastored by a Montrealian. Paul Goulet is, is from Montreal. In fact, the first time I met Paul Goulet was 2011 when he came to do a leadership training with Equip. That was the leadership training at which I met Reverend Chang. All right, I met him the night before, but the, the training was the day after. One day, we were driving through the streets of Vegas and I saw this sign. Worship Thursdays. Guys, I saw this and my heart jumped as a pastor. Because when I, as a pastor, when I see worship, I'm thinking church. 
Do you know what this is? Can you click the next slide? This is a nightclub. And the nightclub advertises that on Thursdays they worship. Worship Thursdays. <laughs> I am telling you, everybody worships. This Tao nightclub is in the Venetian, actually. It's one of the most extravagant and luxurious nightclubs. In, in, and it has this Asian theme. They even have a Buddha there. And they have all these models that come there. And the first was opened in New York in 2000. I think this was opened a bit later. All right. But it's a favorite hangout for a lot of celebrities when they come to Vegas. The Tao nightclub says, worship Thursdays. And look at the subtitle. It says, where the Vegas industry prays. I'm telling you, everyone worships. It's just a matter of what you worship. Or who you worship. Everyone worships. So this is, let's come back to the context. Jesus, Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman. And after a few minutes of dialogue, the woman recognizes that Jesus is someone special. In fact, in her own words, she says, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Why? Because Jesus had just given her a rundown of her life story. Jesus said to her, I know, I know you've had five husbands. And now you moved in with another guy you're not married to. The woman said, Sir, how did you know? So the woman said, Ah, I perceive you are a prophet. Because nobody can tell me this, my life history. I've never met you before. You've never known. How could you tell my life history? So now that the woman realized that this was somebody special that she was talking to, she was like, great. This is an awesome opportunity to ask a prophet, a special man of God, something that has been bothering me for years. And so she asked the question. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. She was talking about Mount Gerizim. This was a mountain on which their forefathers, the Samaritans, the Samaritans were kind of Jews who had adulterated blood. They, they had Assyrian blood. So they were not pure Jews, so to speak. And their forefathers had built a temple on Mount Gerizim, which was similar to the temple in Jerusalem. So there was kind of dual worship. You know, they were doing their own thing in, in, on Mount Gerizim, and the Jews were doing their own thing on, 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 on Mount Mor on, on the other mount. So this was a, there was a great con con controversy between the Jews and the Samaritans about which mountain to worship on, on Mount Gerizim or Mount Moriah. Jesus then says to the woman, woman, worship is not about geography. Huh? Worship is not about whether you worship in Jerusalem or Jakarta. Worship is not about whether we worship in this sanctuary or we go to the park, Jean Drapeau. Jesus says to the woman and she literally shocks her. He says, it's not about where you worship, guys. It's about how you worship and whom you worship. It's not about the external. So that is when she, Jesus comes in verse 21 and says to the woman, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming. When neither on this mountain, Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, will you worship the Father. And in verse 23, he said, the time is coming. Actually, the time is now. The time is here. When the true worshipers, when the true worshipers, I'm telling you, everyone worships, but Jesus says there are true worshipers and there are false worshipers. And I want to put it to you, church. Are you a true worshiper? I'm not asking whether you are a worshiper because everyone worships. What I'm asking is that are you a true worshiper? Jesus said the time is coming. Actually, the time is now here when the true worshipers of God will worship him in a different way. Over the next couple of months, we want to see some of the transformations and reformations that will ensure that we become true worshippers of the Father. Guys, I don't know what has gone on in this church over the past 27 years, but whatever has gone on or not gone on, it is time for us to be true worshippers of the Father. The time to be true worshippers is now. No doubt there's been worship. 
But the question is, how much of it has been true worship? Two characteristics of true worship, as Jesus said. They worship the Father. If there's any worship and it's not of the Father, it's not true worship. So, worship on Thursdays. Can you go back to the Tao sign? Tao restaurant. Worship Thursdays. This is worship all right. But this is not true worship. Because Jesus said true worship is of the Father. Even when we come here and we are supposedly worshiping and I'm singing, here I am to worship and my hand is in my pocket and really I'm thinking about what I'm going to have after lunch, at, at lunch, you know. Here I am to bow down. It's not true worship. True worship is of the Father. It's of the Father and it's to of the Father and it's to the Father. And Jesus said true worship is in spirit and in truth. What does it mean? What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? I'm going to break it down for us, okay? Guys, number one, what does it mean to worship in spirit? I'm talking about restoration of spirit. We need to bring back spirit in our worship. What does it mean to worship in spirit? First of all, it means to worship internal, internally and integrated. In other words, not just what we do on the outside. Jesus, elsewhere in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, he said, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. These people worship me with, with their lips, but their hearts are far away. And Jesus is saying, In vain do they worship me. Do they worship? Yes. Is it true worship? No. Jesus said it's worship, but it's vain worship. Zero worship. Let me read something from time to time. I'm going to quote parts of what John Piper says about this, all right? Later on, we'll study one of John Piper's books called, uh, what's it called again? Desiring God, all right? Later on in the year, right? Listen to what Piper says about spirit, worshiping in spirit. Piper says, worshiping in spirit is the opposite of worshiping in mere external ways. Don't forget, I said worshiping in spirit means worshiping internally and integrated. In other words, it's something is going on within us. And what is going on, with, going on within us is not different from what is going on outside of us. Worshiping in spirit is the opposite of worshiping in mere external ways, Piper says. It's the opposite of formalism and traditionalism. Worship must come from your spirit within instead of being merely formal and external, says Piper. That is worshiping in spirit. It must be internal. It must be integrated. It must be, have integrity. Number two, worship is worshiping in spirit is worshiping with the whole soul, the mind, the will, your feelings, your emotions, your desires, not just bodily actions, guys. Especially when we think just because we showed up in church, we are worshiping. No! We must worship in spirit, our whole soul, our mind, our will, our feelings, our emotions, our desires. Again, Piper says, worship is first and foremost an experience of the heart. Prayer without heart is vain. Songs without heart are vain. Confession and creeds and liturgies and sermons that don't come from the heart are empty and worthless in God's sight. I am asking you, how much of your worship is spirit? If we're going to worship in spirit, it must be internal. But number two, it must encapsulate our whole soul and mind and will and feelings and emotions, our joys, our tears, our sorrows, our fears, all of it come together in worship. Number three, worshiping God in spirit means the spirit part of us doing the worship. You know, there's a part of us, you know man is made of spirit, soul, and body. Everybody knows the body, right? What is the soul? What is your soul? Your soul is the seat of your emotions, your will, and your intellect. That's your soul. What's your spirit? Your spirit is that part of you that communicates with God. That is that part of you that was cut off from God when we sinned against him, separated from God. And that is why when we become Christians, we get born again. That spirit is reconnected with God's spirit because Jesus paid the reconnection fee. <laughs> All right? Our spirit is that part of us that connects with God. And so Jesus is saying, when you worship, 
Worship internally. Worship with your whole soul, mind, will, and all of that. But make sure that you worship with your spirit. The part of you that connects with God. All right? And later on, he goes on in this passage to say why. Because God is spirit. God is spirit. And so if you're going to connect with spirit, it has to be spirit to spirit. Finally, in spirit also means in the Holy Spirit. The, the, the spirit there is small s, it's not capital S. But the reason why I say that worship in spirit also has to do with worshiping in the power and the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is that in John chapter 3 verse 6, Jesus connects God's spirit and our spirit in a very remarkable way. He says that that which is born of the spirit, capital S, is spirit. Small s. Again, let me say the way Piper says it that I couldn't have. He says, in other words, until the Holy Spirit touches our spirit with the flame of life, our spirit is so dead, it does not even qualify our spirit. <laughs> our spirit is so dead, it's like wood. It's not, it does not even qualify our spirit. Only that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So when Jesus says that true worshipers worship in spirit, he must mean that true worship only comes from spirits that are made alive and sensitive and vital by the touch of the Holy Spirit. Guys, I don't know about you, but already I see that some things about my worship must change. Because true worship is worshiping God in spirit. So that is restoration of spirit. But let me go on to talk about reformation by truth. Because Jesus did not just say the true worshipers worship the Father in spirit. He says in spirit and truth. Two things come to mind. Truth meaning, first of all, heart truth. In other words, sincerity. Not faking it. You know, we live in a generation that is full of faking it. In fact, people say things like, fake it till you make it. Yeah. There's a lot of faking. And Jesus said that if you're going to worship in spirit and in truth, truth means not faking it. Do we sometimes fake it? I'm talking about heart truth. But Jesus also means head truth. What, does, what do I mean by head truth? In other words, not only should our worship be sincere, truth in our hearts, but it also must be, must be truth in our heads. Because guess what? You could be sincere, but you could be sincerely wrong. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that, listen, Jesus put it bluntly to this Samaritan woman. In verse 22, Jesus said, you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. And I'm wondering how many of us, even in this church, who may even have been here for 20 years, worship what we do not know. Listen, if you're going to worship in truth, it means we must know the one we are worshiping. Are we worshiping the one and only true God, or is there some other God we have made up in our own minds? You know, the Samaritans rejected all the Old Testament books. Except the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, all right? That's the only book, those were the only books that they would accept. Now, our mission this year, don't forget, is to grow in a biblical understanding of worship and prayer. A biblical understanding. Guys, we need to deconstruct the God we have in our heads and come back to the Bible and say, what does God say about himself in this word? And I know what I'm talking about. There's one young lady in this church. I'm not going to mention her name or anything. She probably will be embarrassed. But anytime I talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, I worry about the kind of God she serves. Because she's always like, wow, God, God, God is about to do something to me. God, God must be so angry that, 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 that I, came, I, I, I woke up one minute after four. Yeah, God is about to. And, and I keep looking at her. Who gave her this idea of God? Guys, We've got to get an idea of God from his word. I'm telling you, there are many Kibakua who don't want to worship our God because they don't have the right idea of who this God is. If we're going to worship God, Jesus said, we're going to worship the Father, we must worship in spirit, but also in truth. Again, listen to what Papa says. Papa said, worship must be vital. No, no, Papa, where, where is that? He says, together, 
Okay. Worship must be vital and real from within. That's true. It must be in spirit. We talked about that. But it says it must be based on the true perception of God. Worshiping in truth is the opposite of worship based on an inadequate view of God. I'm not saying you don't know God at all, but I'm saying perhaps your view of God is inadequate. Oh Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Worship in spirit shows us how to worship, but worship in truth directs us to whom, to whom we worship. Jesus says, for example, do you learn anything about God in this passage we just read from John 4? Anything about God from this passage? What did you learn about God? God is seeking true worshipers. That's the kind of God we're talking about. Anything else you learned about God from this passage? God is spirit. As soon as you know God is spirit, the day Dr. Pebby comes and says, guys, this is God. Let's all come and worship. You wake up and say, shut up, Dr. Pebby. God is spirit. He cannot be a flower. He cannot be the sun. He cannot be the moon. He cannot be the wind. He may move through the wind. He may move through the sun. He may do whatever he wants. He may come in the bodily form as a dove, but he is not a dove. He is spirit. Guys, we need to have, Sally is very concerned about her flower. We need to have the right perception, the truth about God. So together, the word spirit and truth Piper concludes, means that real worship comes from the spirit within and is based on the true views of God. Worship must have heart and worship must have head. Worship must have heart and worship must have head. Worship must engage your emotions and worship must engage your thought. Truth without emotion produces death, death death orthodoxy. Emotion without truth produces empty frenzy and cultivates flaky flaky people who reject the discipline of rigorous thought. True worship comes from people who are deeply emotional and who love deep and sound doctrine. And I can tell you that in the church, we are the two extremes. There are the people that just want to do theology and have this head view of God and, 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 and can't even relate to him in the heart. And then there are people who are like, (laughs) always emotional, and they don't even know what they are worshiping. Guys, may we worship God in spirit and in truth. Let me conclude by why we're talking about rebuilding of the tent. So we're talking about restoration of spirit, reformation by truth. I want to end by talking about rebuilding of the tent. Because in this scripture, I find one of the most humbling things Jesus ever said. I mean, one of the most humbling things in all of scripture for me. For the Father, verse 22, is seeking such people to worship him. Don't you feel some way that God is actually seeking? God is actually looking. God is searching. God who knows everything, yet he searches. Listen, there are very few people, few categories of people I find in scripture that God looks for. God actively searches. One is sinners. Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, I came to seek and to save the lost. The other is intercessors. In Ezekiel 22, 30, he said, I sought a man to stand in the gap so that I do not destroy. The other is true worshippers. The Father is seeking such. Even this morning, throughout the world, they are worshippers. Even in this church, we are all worshipping. But even as we are all worshipping, God is looking among us to see who the true worshippers are. It humbles me that God is seeking true worshipers. And perhaps nobody in scripture personified worship in spirit and truth like David. No wonder God called him a man after my own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 13, Acts 13, 22. There are 14 Old Testament chapters about Abraham. 11 describe the events of Jacob's life. 14 relate to the story of Joseph. 10 chapters talk about Elijah and Elisha. 66 chapters of the Bible talk about David's story. 1,200 references in scripture talking about David, including 59 in the New Testament. Not to talk about the Psalms, even the Psalm 40 we read this morning. Most of the Psalms are David's Psalms. And Kevin Connor says, if we think of a character who speaks of faith, we think of Abraham. 
the father of all who believe. We think of a man of meekness, humility, we think of Moses. If we look for a man of miracles, we think of Elijah or Elisha. But when we look for the Bible character, for praise and worship, we speak of King David. And he's the man after God's heart. Guys, David was not perfect. But he knew how to worship God in passion. With passion. Even when others were laughing, his own wife said, you are worshiping like a fool. He said, look, I'll be more undignified than this. I'm going to worship him some more. I'm going to dance some more. I'm going to twirl some more. Guys, do you want to be a man and woman after God's own heart? In the next few weeks, we're going to look at David's tabernacle or David's tent. And the reason why is that if you look at the scripture, which we probably will not have time to read in Acts chapter 12, you know, when people, when the Gentiles, those of us who are not Jews, when we started becoming Christians, we started believing, like with the story of Cornelius and his household, the early church did not know what to do with us, those of us who are not Jews. My friend Peter actually is Jewish, all right? But apart from Peter, is anybody else here who is Jewish? So we have one Jew here, the rest of us are Gentiles. All right, so the Jews always believed that God was for them and them alone. And all of a sudden, Gentiles, Chinese, and Africans, and, and, and other Asians, and, 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 and people from the Caribbean, all these people were being saved, Europeans, and the, the church did not know what to do with them. And what happened was that some people wanted these new Christians to stay according to the heavy restrictions of the laws and the ceremonies and all the spiritual bondage that they had had with the Old Testament. And other people said, no, these people are free in Christ. They don't have to do ceremonies. And the one particular they were arguing about was circumcision. And the, the people said, if you don't get circumcised, you cannot be a true Christian. So this was serious. They had a meeting in Acts 15. We will not read about, but you can read it. It's, it's printed in your handbooks. They had a meeting. And at this meeting, James... Apostle James, the brother of Jesus, not James the disciple because he was cut, his head had already been cut off by now by Herod. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And he gets up and he speaks from the prophet Amos. He quotes Amos chapter 9 and he says, God himself said, After this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. That the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all Gentiles who are called by his name, says the Lord, who makes things known from of old. Then he says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. It is interesting that the very passage James quotes talks about Gentiles being saved, but it also talks about the rebuilding of David's tent. Why does the Bible talk about the rebuilding of David's tent? Kevin Connor says, while other ceremonials and ritualisms of the Old Testament pass to the cross and are abolished there, there are many things we don't do anymore. We don't sacrifice animals and all of that. We don't do any of that because they are abolished at the cross. Yet expressions of worship pass to the cross and through the cross to the new covenant. Listen, through the cross, our expressions of worship are purified. Worship and praise will never be abolished. Worship and praise are eternal. But there are some lessons we can learn from the tabernacle of David, the way it was designed. We want to learn about continuous worship. Skillful worship, creative worship, extravagant worship, expressive worship, open worship. And so from next week, we'll be picking each one of these things. Because there's something we can learn about the way the temple, because the tabernacle of David was not the temple. Solomon built the temple. It was David who went to pick the ark of the covenant that had been neglected for about 20 years or so in somebody's house. And he built a tent. Can you show them that? Did you show them the tent? It was just a simple tent. And he put the Ark of the Covenant there. It's okay. Shall we be on our feet? And talk to the Lord in the next minute. Are you a, tr are you a true worshiper? I'm not asking whether you are a worshiper. Otherwise, you will not be in church this morning. You are already a worshiper. The question is, are you a true worshiper? Talk to God this moment. Maybe something has to change about your worship. Is it in spirit? Is it from within? Is it with your whole soul and mind and emotions and everything? Is it from your spirit to God's spirit? Is it empowered by the Holy Spirit? Is it in truth? 
Some of us just need to pray and say, God, show me who you really are. Not even what my father said you are. Some of us have a picture of God that our father told us, and our father did not even read the Bible. Guys, we need to worship in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. And if there's anybody here who does not yet know Jesus personally, this is your opportunity. And ask him to come into your life. And say, Lord, I want a fresh start. Because everyone worships. The question is, who, what, and how? We come to you and we confess that any way we have not worshipped you in spirit and in truth, even though we come to church, even though we've been Christians for many years, that you show us. We repent of whenever we have not worshipped the Father in spirit and in truth. Forgive us and teach us over the next few weeks what has to change, what has to be reformed, what has to be transformed as we restore spirit and truth and rebuild the temple of David. We want to be people after your own heart. Oh, help us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.